Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ba'd. Rabbi shahli sadri wa ahsirli amri wa ahlal uqdadam min lisani yafqa qawli. Dear brothers and sisters, we are here uh, again uh, tonight, inshallah, for our broadcast, uh, our webinar. We have a very uh, interesting topic, Islamic terrorism, an oxymoron by uh, Brother Riaz Larif. Uh, just wanted to mention before I hand over the microphone to him, is that if you have any questions, inshallah, there is a question box at the bottom of your chat I mean, uh, of the, uh, the webinar. You can just... Uh, get your questions ready as he's speaking so at the end of the uh, presentation after 25 minutes we will uh start to uh, spend about 20 minutes to take the uh, questions that you have inshallah so with that i will hand over to uh brother riaz bismillah alhamdulillah alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haqq li yudhhirahu ala din kullih وكفى بالله شهيدا محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم جعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر اللهم آمين يا رب العالمين Jazakumullah khairan to everyone for joining this uh, session this evening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala account your time uh, in your scale of good deeds. And inshallah, please make that niyyah as we enter into this presentation. Uh, today's uh, topic uh, that was given to me uh, was Islamic terrorism and oxymoron. Again, we, I'm sure that most of us know uh, what the definition of an oxymoron is. Uh, it is a figure of speech by which an expression produces uh, seemingly contradictory meanings. Uh, for example, something like uh, cruel kindness, uh, deafening silence, uh, forward retreat, and irregular pattern. As you see this, uh, as you see these uh, two words, they don't go with each other. They are opposite to one another. And uh, similarly, Islamic uh, terrorism or Islam and terrorism, they don't go together. And inshallah, I will address that uh, through that, I mean, through this topic here today. Uh, when I was presenting this topic uh, a while ago, uh, one of the brothers in the audience, he uh, gave me another example, which is uh, happily married happily married, and uh, that uh, brought some chuckles <laughs> uh, in the group, if you will. So uh, so that is, uh, with that said, uh, we'll, let's get into uh, the definition of uh, terrorism uh, itself. Here are some of uh, the definitions that are uh, provided. I mean, uh, if you look at the literal definition, uh, it goes something like this, the unlawful use of violence and intimidation especially against civilians in the pursuit of political aims. And uh, of course, our CIA and our FBI, they have their own uh, uh, definitions as well. Uh, CIA says it's a premeditated, uh, premeditated and politically motivated violence perpetrated against uh, non-combatant targets. And FBI says uh, it's a violent and criminal act committed by individuals or groups to further ideological goals uh, related to political, religious, social, racial, and whatnot. So these are some of the definitions uh, that you find uh, for uh, terrorism. And if you look at uh, some of the acts of terrorism from the history, uh, you would find that these definitions will uh, fit those uh, things. And I want to, the reason why I, why I want to present this is when we talk about uh, terrorism, uh, and Islam and Muslims, we don't have the monopoly uh, in, uh, in committing terrorism. Uh, terrorism, uh, it does not have any religion. Uh, terrorism uh, committed by uh, people from all over the world belonging to uh, all kinds of religions and probably even to no religion. So uh, we need to make it clear that uh, uh, when we talk about uh, terrorism, that people have this mindset that only Muslims commit terrorism and we should kind of basically break that uh, uh, stereotype uh, right from the beginning of a conversation. So all these things, I'm not gonna go into uh, the details of these examples. You can see here uh, some of the examples that I presented. 
again, the massacre of Native Americans uh, here in our own country and the Holocaust again, Jews, uh, the massacre in Bosnia, the Oklahoma City bombing, the 9-11 incident, and the Norway terrorist in, uh, incident, and recently uh, what our brothers uh, and sisters had to endure in the New Zealand uh, mosque massacre. All these things are acts of uh, terrorism. And in my opinion, uh, the gun violence that takes place in this country, uh, according to the recent report, uh, 36,000 plus, I think it's around 36,200 or something like that, deaths uh, happen due to gun violence in the USA. And each and every death is an act of terrorism. We have to keep that in uh, mind as well. So terrorism, it has a, a broader concept. So now that we are, again, in our topic, we are, we are going to present uh, what is uh, our, how, uh, what is uh, the Islamic viewpoint when it comes to terrorism or what kind of uh, questions or mindset or attitude people have uh, towards Islam and Muslims when it comes to terrorism and violence. Uh, that's what we're going to be addressing today. Some of the common accusations that we hear, uh, especially uh, uh, we've done a, a variety of uh, open houses and dava booths and, uh, and whatnot. Uh, and here are some of the common accusations that you hear from uh, uh, people from other faith, uh, people who are not very well informed about uh, Islam. Uh, again, I don't want to go through this uh, every, uh, I mean, line by line or bullet by bullet. Uh, you can just read through this. I'm sure that I can share this uh, deck uh, one way or another, uh, probably after the session. You guys can uh, go through this on, uh, in your own time. But these are some of the com uh, um, uh, common accusations about Islam. Islam is violent. Uh, Islam commands Muslims to kill disbelievers wherever they find. I mean, this is a famous one. This is uh, uh, the Islamophobes. They love this. And uh, Islam kills those who leave the religion. Again, uh, the punishment for apostasy. And uh, Islam promotes slavery. And Islam encourages suicide bonding, uh, bombing and things like that. So there are various accusations uh, or assumptions about uh, Islam and Muslims when it comes to violence and uh, terrorism. And we don't have time to attack uh, every single one of this. So uh, the next uh, 20 or so minutes that we have, I'm just going to pick one item, which is actually the bullet, the uh, bullet number two. Uh, Islam commands Muslims to kill disbelievers wherever they find. Uh, so we're just going to talk about that in our session today. And, and hopefully, uh, if there is interest in any of the other topics, we can address them uh, in future sessions, if you will. Uh, future sessions, if you will. Um, the reason why I picked that, uh, picked uh, the bullet number two is uh, that is something that we commonly hear uh, by the Islamophobes and people who are misinformed when they come to a dawah booth or when they come to the open house. They kind of talk about this uh, particular uh, 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 particular words in the Quran. And by the way, before I start, I want to, uh, again, uh, this is a rhetorical question. Uh, does Quran really say kill disbelievers wherever you find them? Um, and normally when I conduct these classes in a classroom like setting where I can interact with people, uh, some I've heard from folks that uh, I've, uh, even from the Muslim audience, uh, if you will, uh, some of them do think that this verse does not uh, is not present in the Quran, that killing disbelievers wherever you find them, and uh, and and some do believe that it does exist. But when I ask them the question, how many times does this exist in the Quran? Uh, usually, I hear uh, it's once it, it exists once in the Quran or twice in the Quran. Uh, but in fact, actually, uh, the Quran, um, it, uh, it has about uh, four verses related to this particular statement uh, or similar statement, killing disbelievers wherever you find them. And inshallah, we're going to go through uh, all those uh, four uh, uh, verses. And I want to make sure that uh, I give you the right background uh, 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 for those verses so, do you, so you understand why this is present in the Quran. And I'm sure that'll take up our next uh, uh, 20 minutes or so, uh, if you will. So the first place that uh, the Quran says, uh, killing, uh, kill wherever you find them or kill the infidels wherever you find them is in Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, verse number 190. That is chapter two, verse number 190. And the second place where it says is in, is in Surah An-Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 89 and 91. So in Nisa, it occurs twice in verse number 89, and it also occurs in verse number 91. And the third place it occurs is in Surah Tawbah, 
which is uh, tab number nine and verse number, uh, verse number five. So these are the four uh, verses that talk about this particular wording, if you will, killing disbelievers wherever you find them. And inshallah, we'll uh, go through each one of them. So here is that verse. Uh, so this is uh, verse number uh, 191. Sorry, I was wrong. It's not 190, it is 191. Uh, and I also want to probably uh, tell you a story. Uh, once I was uh, invited to uh, uh, give a khutbah to one of, uh, at one of the uh, masajid attached to a local university. So uh, after I finished the uh, khutbah, some of the students, uh, they approached me and uh, they asked, uh, Brother Riaz, uh, we have a brother uh, who is interested in Islam and he has some questions about Islam. Uh, do you uh, mind um, talking to him? So I said, yes. And uh, then, uh, so the office of that masjid was upstairs. So we kind of walk upstairs with that, uh, with the brother. Uh, and we went up there and we sat down. We, uh, we exchanged the usual formalities. And I asked him uh, what question uh, uh, he has about uh, uh, Islam. And the question uh, uh, that he had was, why does the Quran say, that kill the disbelievers wherever you find them. Then, of course, he uh, he had a, uh, I mean, we had a Quran on, on the table, a translation. So he opened up the Quran and he showed me the verse, which is uh, that uh, verse number two, uh, chapter number two, verse number 191. So uh, I, uh, so then I, all I, all I asked him to do is to read that, uh, um, read the verse in context, starting with uh, verse number 190. And going through 191, 192, and 193. So I asked him to re just read that in context. So the verse starts, or the section uh, starts, fight in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those who fight you but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like transgressors. After Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning this, then he goes to ayah number 191, where he says, and kill them, wherever you overtake them and expel them from whenever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. And do not fight them at Masjid al-Haram until they fight you there. But if they fight you, then kill them, such as the recompense of the disbelievers. And the uh, uh, section continues. And if they cease, then indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is forgiving and merciful. Fight them until there is no more fitna, until worship is acknowledged for Allah. But if they cease, then there is to be no aggression except against uh, except against oppressors. So I asked him to kind of read this uh, in context. Then he read it. He took a few minutes. He read through it. Then I asked him, what does it say? Uh, and then he understood that this is uh, in a state of war when uh, it's a defensive uh, jihad. When they fight you, you fight back. And in that state of war, you can kill uh, your opponents. Uh, so then I asked him, does it make sense? Uh, then he said, yes, it does make sense. Uh, then I asked him, does he have any more uh, question? And he said, no, he doesn't have any more questions. So all he had was just that one question. Then I normally ask this, uh, uh, this question anytime that I uh, interact with, uh, with a brother. I usually, uh, at the, towards, the end, towards the end of the conversation, I usually ask them uh, that, what is stopping you from accepting Islam? And uh, since it's been my uh, practice, I also asked this brother, what's stopping you from accepting Islam? And in this case, uh, apparently, uh, the brother said that there's nothing stopping me from accepting Islam. And we walked down uh, to the uh, to the basement uh, where the brothers were having lunch uh, and whatnot. So he just stood in front of them and he took the shahada right then and there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, guided that brother on that day uh, just by explaining this uh, was in a very simple uh, manner. So again, uh, we should not, uh, again, I'm probably uh, taking a tangent here. We should not discount the value of a short conversation that you might have uh, with people. Because this brother who came there, he, he did not, he wasn't, he didn't convert just on that day. He's been, he had been learning about Islam for a very long time. People have been fe feeding, about, feeding information about Islam in one conversation and another conversation and whatnot. And finally, all he was left with was, was with this question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened his heart. So don't discount every single conversation, every single interaction that you may have with people. Everything is of value. Again, so 
even though we didn't get a chance to discuss this in uh, detail with that brother because this this was self-explanatory and uh, he ended up accepting islam but i wanted i want you all to have the right understanding behind these verses uh, the right context of these verses so you understand why these verses were revealed so in case if you get into conversations you are uh, equipped with the details or the information uh, uh, to defend uh, these verses from the quran the context is uh, is this Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we all know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he did not give permission for the Muslims to uh, take arms when they were living in Mecca. And for 13 years, they, didn't, they were not given permission. And even after migrating uh, to Medina, they were, they, still, they were still not given permission to uh, uh, take up arms. Then eventually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, uh, told he informed the Muslims or he allowed the Muslims to take uh, take up arms against the, uh, uh, against the disbelievers who fight them. And that's why the verse 190 was revealed. Uh, according to another opinion, uh, again, majority of the scholars, they say that verse number two, uh, uh, sorry, chapter number two, verse number 190, that was the first verse that was revealed, uh, uh, giving permission for the Muslims to uh, take up ar arms against the disbelievers and against the polytheists. But there is a minority opinion, uh, which is mentioned, we have a minority, minority opinion, which is also held by Abu Bakr, anh, uh, where the verse that is present in Surah Al Hajj, verse number 39. So this comes in uh, Surah Al-Hajj. So some scholars, they say that this is the first, uh, uh, this is the first ayah that gave uh, the permission to fight. But majority opinion is that uh, chapter number two, verse number 190 uh, was the first uh, one giving the permission. So 190, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fight those people who fight you. And then of course, 191, in the same context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, talks about uh, uh, killing wherever you uh, finding uh, wherever you find the enemies uh, in in battle and in war, uh, and according to uh, the scholars, verse number one ninety one, it was not revealed uh, during the Battle of Badr. Uh, verse number one ninety was before Badr, which led to Badr, and verse number one ninety one was uh, revealed during uh, Umrul Al Qada. So we all know in the in the sixth year of uh, the Prophet, uh, the sixth year of Hijrah, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he signed a treaty with uh, uh, with the uh, with the Quraysh of uh, Mecca, and uh, they said that uh, this year you cannot uh, perform your Umrah, you come back the next year. So uh, the next year, Umrah al Qada, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions they uh, uh, performed uh, Umrah al Qada, and uh, during that time. Uh, uh, since they were constant uh, fighting between uh, the Quraysh and the Muslims, some of the companions they were worried that uh, that the Quraysh may not keep up their word, may not keep their word, and they may start fighting and killing uh, the Muslims when they were in ihram. So they expressed this concern to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and as a result, the Mufassirin they say that Allah subhanahu wa taala He revealed uh, uh, verse number one ninety one. So, uh, of course, uh, as we know from history, nothing like that happened. Uh, uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and, uh, and the companions, they performed Umrah Al-Qadha uh, without uh, uh, any issues. Uh, they performed uh, the Umrah Al-Qadha and they came back. And we, again, when it comes to uh, battle, we all know uh, the conditions of the battle. It should be for the sake of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala and not for uh, any material interest or to gain wealth or power. And uh, again, this is, not, uh, it's, this is not an exhaustive list, if you will. I just want to present something. Uh, again, neutral parties and non-combatants and uh, women and children and places of worship, and uh, they should not be destroyed and uh, they should not be harmed. And we should not uh, mutilate any uh, dead bodies. We cannot uh, destroy the infrastructure of the enemies and things like that. So there is a, there is a whole set of uh, rules of engagement when it comes to uh, war and battle in Islam. So. As you understand, the whole Surah Al-Baqarah, the reason why Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala revealed this, this is more of, uh, uh, this is more, uh, in, uh, the situation is in a state of war. Yes, if they're gonna fight you, then you can fight back. Then of course, during that fight, uh, you can uh, kill the enemies. So now let's move on to uh, uh, the next one, uh, uh, Surah An-Nisa. So here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, uh, Again, you seize them and kill them wherever you find them. 
So this verse is uh, present uh, in Surah An Nisa. And let me just bring up all these verses so we can uh, talk about this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says uh, in uh, verse number 89, uh, but if they turn away, then seize them and kill them wherever you find them. And then, of course, uh, in verse number 91, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, if so, if they do not withdraw from you or offer you peace or restrain their hands, then seize them and kill them wherever you overtake them. So uh, I don't want to go through the entire uh, verses, uh, but inshallah, you can read this uh, when you do have some time. Read from uh, ayah number 488 uh, through ayah, ayah 48, 491. So, but this particular uh, term of killing the disbelievers wherever you find them, it's present in uh, verse number 89 and also in uh, 91. Again, here is the context. Uh, let's get into the uh, context of these verses. After, uh, after the Muslims settled in Medina and after they acquired uh, some power and established uh, the state, for the Muslims to live in peace and security, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he uh, extended an open invitation uh, to everybody, uh, to all the Muslims who are living in uh, non-Muslim lands to come and uh, live in uh, Medina. So this was a condition at that time. Again, I wanna make sure this is a condition for that time and place. Uh, it's not applicable today. Uh, these conditions have been, uh, have been uh, abrogated uh, through other verses of the uh, of the Quran, so at that time the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, the uh, the requirement of the believers where if they are living uh, in a non-Muslim land where they are unable to uh, practice their faith openly and completely, the invitation was to come to Medina and practice their faith. Uh, what happened was some of uh, some of the people from uh, uh, Mecca, they outwardly they accepted Islam. Uh, uh, just to make sure that they don't get uh, uh, harmed by the Muslims during their travel and their business and whatnot. As we know that the travel path uh, to uh, Sham is through Medina. And they kind of outwardly uh, profess their faith uh, to save themselves from any harm that might come to them uh, from the Muslims. But internally, they did not believe in, uh, uh, in Islam. They did not uh, have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their heart. As a matter of fact, they also uh, plotted with the Quraysh to bring harm uh, to the Muslims, to Islam and Muslims. So since these uh, people, uh, since they had outwardly professed Islam, there were two opinions that were, uh, that there were two opinions amongst the companions. One set of companions, they said, uh, how can we uh, kill these people? Because they professed Islam, uh, they said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. Outwardly, how can we persecute them? But there is a second group of uh, companions. They said, No, they did not. Uh, they did not profess uh, Islam. They just only outwardly uh, did that uh, to prevent themselves from harm. But they were playing uh, on the side of the Quraysh and, and uh, on the side of the Kuffar, and they are trying to plot and plan against the Islam, plan against Islam and Muslims. So they said that they ought to be punished. So when this uh, debate was going on between uh, the two uh, sections of the Muslims, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he revealed uh, the, these ayat saying that, no, they are not Muslims. They have committed treason and they should be killed. So except, and of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he uh, gave an exception, ex except for the people who are with whom uh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa had a treaty. So here, these verses, 89 and 91, they are talking about those people who are living outside the territory of Islam, out, outside the territory of the Muslims, and planning and plotting with the enemies of Islam to bring harm to the Muslims. In this situation, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave the verdict that they indeed are not believers and they ought to be punished. And uh, so that's why, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that during battle, you can find them, you can kill them uh, during uh, uh, that battle. Uh, again, so what is the easy way to explain this to, uh, to the people uh, in our current context? For example, if uh, someone were to, from this country, if someone were to uh, plot with an enemy country, say uh, Russia and whatnot, and if they plot with them to bring harm to, uh, to Americans, the, this country says the punishment for treason is death. So, and these 
verses are talking about treason, committing treason against the Muslim Islam, against Islam and the Muslims. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave this verdict to kill them wherever you find them. So this is the context of uh, Surah, and, uh, Surah and Nisa. Uh, Brother uh, Azad, how many, how, how many more minutes do I have? Okay, um, you could continue. We still have a few more minutes. Um, it's 25, but uh, if you wanted okay. to finish up, maybe five, seven minutes more. Is that okay? okay? All right. Yep. Yeah, inshallah, we'll finish this up too. All right. So, uh, so the last, inshallah, we'll try to uh, go through this uh, quickly. So here is the verse uh, from uh, Surah Tawbah, chapter number nine, uh, chapter number nine, verse number five, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He says, "Faqtulu al-mushrikin ahiyu wajatumuhum, wa khuduhum wa hsuruhum, wa qoudu lahum kulla marsad." Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He says, "Then kill the polities wherever you find them, and capture them, and besiege them, and sit and wait for them at every place of ambush." So here, this Surah Tawbah was revealed around the time of uh, the battle of it's skipping me. The, the, the name is skipping me. Uh, the battle of Tabuk. So the most of the verses were revealed around the battle of Tabuk, but some verses were revealed. Some verses revealed. It talked about uh, the conquest of Mecca. It uh, it talked about the uh, the battle of Hunain uh, and whatnot. Uh, so and also. Uh, the the uh, the Hajj that happened on the ninth year, uh, where the Prophet ﷺ did not participate uh, in the ninth year of Hajj, but Abu Bakr and Ali they went and they uh, Abu Bakr uh, and Ali they went and uh, did their Hajj. The Prophet ﷺ did not uh, perform Hajj. So the context is uh, we know from uh, the Medinan history that any time the Prophet ﷺ made a treaty either with the Jews or with the Mushrik or with the pagans of Mecca, they always, they always broke the treaty. And Prophet ﷺ, he, instead of completely focusing on spreading the message of Islam, he ought, always had to watch his back uh, to save the Muslims, to protect the Muslims from the harms that could be brought by these people who, whom he had treaty, uh, treaty with. Uh, with Jews, I mean, with Jews, we know what happened with Banu Qaynuq, uh, Banu Nadir, and Banu Quraida, and even with uh, um, uh, with the Quraysh, uh, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah was broken after a year. So constantly they were breaking treaties. Then finally, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala He wanted to free the land of Arabia from the Mushrik, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala revealed the Surah Bara'a, basically a complete immunity uh, from all the treaties and uh, and and everything because they were constantly plotting and planning to bring harm to the Muslims. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finally said, enough is enough. Then you have four months to either accept Islam or you peacefully leave the place because you guys have been plotting against us with the Jews, with people outside uh, Mecca to bring harm to the Muslims. We cannot just keep fighting with you all the time. We have a job to do. So we give you four months. Within these four months, if you want to accept Islam, you can you can live with us but if you don't accept islam with the four, within four months you can either leave uh, you can you can leave or you or a war or we're going to fight you so then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that context of war allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said yes you can fight them and kill them and wherever you find them but history says no such war took place after these verses were revealed people either left or most of them accepted islam but no war took place. This is a threat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the mushrik of Mecca. And just place, I mean, pay attention to this verse. Normally, the Islamophobes, they don't talk about this verse, which is the verse six. And if any of the polytheists seeks your protection, then grant him protection so that he may hear the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even in the battlefield, as you are fighting, if they ask you for your protection, you give them protection. Not only give them protection, then deliver him to his place of safety. You take them to a place of safety. That is because they are a people who do not know. So this is a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to the people of Quraysh because they were constantly, constantly violating the treaties. But again, after the four months passed, no war ensued, no battle ensued. No one was killed. People accepted Islam or they left on their own. So, so, so that is the concept uh, context of uh, verse number four. 
And I'll just say a few words and then inshallah we can uh, take uh, uh, questions. Now we already talked about it. I'm not gonna, I'm gonna skip through this because uh, don't have much time. Uh, so what does the Quran say? Obviously we don't, we just don't want to explain what the stance of terrorism uh, in, uh, the uh, acts of terror in Islam and not explain what Islam actually says. Uh, I've given a, a few verses here. So uh, inshallah, you can uh, take a look at it uh, when you have some time. Here, Allah, in verse number 5-8, I'm not gonna go through everything. Ya yuhal ladina amanu, o you who believe, kunu qawwa amina lillahi shu'ada bil qist. Stand firmly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, witnessing for just justice. Wa la yajrimannakum shana'anu qawmin ala alla ta'adilu. Don't let your hatred be unjust towards others. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, even though you may not like a people, even if, even if they committed a crime against you, don't let your hatred be unjust towards those people. This is the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Nisa, he says, Ya amanu, similar words, Ya yuhal, oh you who believe, kunu bil Stand firmly for justice, with, as witnesses for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, walaw ala anfusihim awil walidayni wal aqrabin. You stand firmly for justice, even if it is against yourself or your children or your relatives. This is the teaching of Islam. Islam is asking us to stand up for justice. And that is what we hear from uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. Again, I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, uh, you guys can read it on your own. And I wanna end with this statement uh, from uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah. In his book uh, on I'alam uh, al-Mu'aqeen and Rabbi al-Alameen, he says, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, verily the Sharia, the Islamic Sharia is founded upon wisdom and welfare for the servants in this life and the afterlife. In its entirety, it is justice, mercy, benefit, and wisdom. Every matter which abandons justice for tyranny, mercy for cruelty, benefit for corruption, and wisdom for foolishness is not part of the Sharia, even if it was introduced therein by an interpretation. Even somebody were to introduce these things through an interpretation of the Quran, he says, no, that is not gonna be part of the Sharia. And this is a great uh, saying of Ibn al-Qayyim that we have to keep in mind. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the knowledge of our deen and help us practice it and help us uh, spread the message of Islam and fulfill our responsibility uh, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَآخِرُ دَعَانِ الْحَمْدَ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَجَزَاكُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرٌ Inshallah, we can uh, take questions. Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Okay, Inshallah, if you can, if you have any questions, you can type it in the question section on the chat group. Um, so we have one question. Someone was asking, is uh, Surah Tawbah uh, revealed after the conquest of Mecca or after the Battle of Tabuk? So it is, it is around the Battle of Tabuk, but some of the verses that were revealed, they were revealed about the Battle of, the conquest of Makkah was mentioned, and the Battle of Hunain was explicitly mentioned. And even the the Hajj, uh, the, 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 the Bara happened after, the Bara happened in age, uh, the Hijri 9. Okay. The Hijri 9, it happened in, in Hijri 9. So a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, historical, uh, uh, incidents were, were covered in uh, Surah Tawbah. Yeah, Zakhlaq, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, someone asked, uh, they will get this, we will, uh, inshallah, you can have this presentation uh, afterwards and all the previous ones as well. Um, it's uploaded and I will share the link, inshallah, shortly. So someone asked, uh, often Christians say, well, the Bible doesn't have anything uh, this violent and it makes it, you know, Christians are hip, is a hippie religion. It's all about love. Is there anything in the Bible similar or what can we say in this situation? Okay, <laughs> I didn't want to go there. Uh, since the question was asked, let me go there. So here are some of the verses, right? From the Old Testament. The people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground. Their pregnant women ripped open. Hosea 13:16. In Deuteronomy, if your 
very own brother or your son or daughter or the wife you love or your closest friend secretly entices you saying, let us go and worship other gods, meaning apostasy, right? Leaving your religion and going and worshiping other gods. Do not yield to them or listen to them. Show them no pity. Do not spare them or shield them. You must certainly put them to death. The punishment for apostasy, according to the Bible, is putting them to death. Your hand must be the first in putting them to death. And then the hands of all the people stone them to death because they try to turn you away from the Lord of your God. And here, now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy, destroy everything that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. I'm going to skip this. It talks about this uh, uh, again. Uh, then the Lord God said to the women, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me. Again, it's talking about the, the original sin. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. So this is Bible saying that the punishment for deceiving Adam is God made, billah, he made childbearing very severe with painful labor. You will give birth to your children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Uh, Again, when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. If they accept and open their gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. Again, compare this to Surah Tawbah, what we talked about, right? If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord God, your, uh, when the when the Lord your God delivers it in your hand, put the sword, put the sword to all the men in it. As for the women and children and the livestock and everything else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourselves. Coming to New Testament. Again, Jesus saying, do not think that I have, I mean, many, many people say, okay, these are all Old Testament. We don't worry about Old Testament, but this is what Jesus said. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's just Jesus saying, the law of Old Testament also applies to my people. He says in New Testament, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. His body of which he is the savior. Now as the church submits to the Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Uh, skipping through some of the stuff uh, here. Do not suppose that I've come, to, Jesus saying, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus saying again, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. Again, uh, this is about uh, homosexuality in the Bible and the prohibition. So, I mean, these are some of the voices. Uh, I, I mean, you, you, know, you get the point. Thank you. Okay, and also I think you, uh, one of the um, popular verses that uh, um, was a good debate in Jamaica between a Muslim scholar, I don't know if you saw this, uh, and, um, and the people were saying that there were no uh, verses that even from Jesus himself saying, uh, and here in Luke 19, verse 27, mm -hmm. Uh, Jesus says, and these enemies of mine who were unwilling for me to rule over them, bring them here and slay them in front of me. So this is uh, in Luke 19, uh, verse 27. Okay. So uh, I, mean, I mean, there is all kinds of verses in the Bible yeah. that we can uh, okay. bring us let evidence. Me, let me ask you a question. Are you familiar with the book Cutting the Fuse? Uh, by Robert Poppy and James Feldman. Are you asking me? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. So this, this is a book. It, it's a, about the explosive, explosion of global suicide, terrorism, and how to stop it, right? And I just, and these are two professors, and they've done like extreme amount of work uh, on, on this subject, terrorism and suicide and stuff like that. So Can you repeat chapter, the book name, brother? Yeah, it, Cutting the Fuse. Okay. Cutting cutting the fuse. Okay. So I just wanted to mention, so in chapter one, the title of chapter one is why occupation ignites suicide terrorism, right? So, I mean, <laughs> just to go to say, 
it's very good. And in 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 start and it says the root cause. This is in the first chapter, the uh, page twenty. The root cause of suicide terrorism, and and they have done studies from nineteen eighty to two thousand three, and it shows uh, that the occupation means that the people are uh, because of occupation and not religion, is the reason why people are, are committing uh, suicide and. Uh, these acts of terrorism. So inshallah, and there's, you know, C-SPAN has a thing on this and it's on Amazon. Actually, the book is actually $1.99 on Amazon right now. Okay, next question is, yeah, we, we get access to this presentation, yes. Okay, how do you explain the Muslim conquest during the Khulafa? Are Muslims allowed to just go fight and conquer people? So there is, uh... We have to understand uh, that in Islam, there are two types of jihad. And we have to be open about it. Uh, and one is the defensive jihad. And the verses that you uh, talk, the, the verses that we reviewed today, uh, they are mostly about uh, defensive jihad. But there is also offensive jihad. The offensive jihad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gave permission for the Muslims to perform a, a offensive jihad to liberate people from oppression. So yes, and one form of oppression is to worship others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, the Muslim, uh, uh, the rulers, the, even the Khulafai Rashidin, when they were going against uh, uh, the Persians and uh, the Romans, yes, they uh, went after them to liberate the people. But at the same time, we have to keep in mind, no one was forced to convert. The option was to accept Islam or pay jizya or to fight. And most of them, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, we know from the history, they accepted this, they either accepted Islam or they paid jizya. So this is how the world worked at that time. If you, this is how the empire grew, but it did not grow again. We have to keep in mind the the reason why this was usually brought up is that we forcefully converted others at the hands of sword. No, that never happened. We can clearly say from our history with clear conscience that never happened. We never, none of our predecessors, they forcefully converted people at the sword. They were given the option, and many of them did accept and. People did not accept either. People who did not accept, they paid the jizya. So we have to keep in mind that, yes, both of them are acceptable. And when you are answering questions, I also want to say, I want to remind you of a hadith from Ali radiallahu anhu, where he said, speak people, speak to people at their level of knowledge. Do you wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger to be rejected? So here he is giving us a wise advice. Ali radiallahu anhu is giving us a wise advice. We have to talk to people at their level of knowledge. You don't overwhelm them with uh, offensive jihad and defensive jihad initially. Give them information, spoon feed them. If they require more information, then you talk about offensive jihad. You don't want to open up, up, open up about offensive jihad in your first conversation because that will put them off once they get some amount of, some amount of knowledge, yes, you can present this uh, present this information. But we should never lie. We should never hide. If if they if they, if the question was asked, you present them in the best possible way. And and this is how uh, empires spread uh, in those times by uh, uh, conquering countries. But we never in our history we never can falsely converted people. Okay, thank you very much. And also, can you translate the verse La ikraha fi din? Yes, La Ikrah uh, din it comes, uh, it's chapter number two, verse number 256, uh, right after Ayat al Qursi, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, La Ikrah Hafiddin, Khattabayana Rushid Amin al Ghai. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there is no compulsion in religion. And uh, so, and, uh, and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, uh, in Surah uh, Yunus, if I uh, remember correctly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that do not, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had wanted, he would have made everybody as Muslims. Then will you, O Muhammad, force? Con I mean, of course, Prophet did not do it, but this is a uh, this is a way of uh, this is a way of the Quran 
if I think, uh, this is the way of the Quran, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains, will you then, O Muhammad, compel people to accept Islam? So this is, uh, comes in uh, uh, Surah, Surah Yunus. And again, uh, we all know there is no, I mean, uh, it, it is against our deen to convert people to Islam. And even if some, even if you were to forcefully convert someone, Islam is all about a person's heart and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is between a person and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If they outwardly expect, uh, uh, accept Islam, what's the point? There's no point in forcefully converting uh, anybody. Okay, and of course, you. Islam stands against, against it. Okay, and the next question is, uh, did Muslim rulers commit atrocities against others? Um, <laughs> this uh, is, I mean, uh, if you go through the history, uh, you would find some weak rulers. They probably committed uh, some acts uh, here and there. We cannot say that all of our uh, Muslim rulers uh, from the history, from the uh, from the uh, from the Khulafai Rashidin until. Uh, until the collapse of the, uh, the Khilafah in 1924, we cannot say that all of them were uh, uh, wise and they were completely uh, filled with taqwa and whatnot. Uh, some of them, yes, I think we have to. But again, we have to differentiate, like how we differentiate today, the teachings of Islam from the acts of the people. We cannot tell that all the rulers of Islam uh, were pure and uh, um, they were free of sin. No, they committed uh, they committed uh, atrocities, and we have to uh, tell them that we have that is not the teaching of Islam. People commit people uh, due to their own shortcomings. They do commit mistakes. Okay, and and, and next question is um, it, it's sort of like a culmination. Is this when someone asks you these questions in the beginning of a conversation? Uh, what is the best approach in in, in uh, starting a discussion, especially? If you're going to have a civil discussion, because I mean, these these are are are, are sort of like fire bait. Yes. People are just tossing questions, and they don't understand uh, much about Islam. These are like Fox narrative, Fox uh, News <laughs> narrative questions that that you see there. Is this the the ideal way to go about starting a discussion, especially if you wanted to do tawa and to reach out to the person? I would. Start? I would never start with, I mean, not just these questions, any questions people uh, you may face in, uh, uh, in your interaction with uh, people from other faith, uh, I wouldn't just answer the question right away, especially questions like this, because without any background and whatnot, they are not able to understand. And uh, anytime I, I, I get asked a question, I always go back and tell them about Islam about a little bit and then come back and address the questions. I, when they come back and tell me, okay, why does your Quran say this? Then I would say, that's a good question. You acknowledge that's a good question, but do you have a couple of minutes uh, where we can talk about it? I wanna mention something very quickly uh, to you in two minutes and then I'll come back and address. And then within those two minutes, you explain to them about the important ones because you may not even see this person again and you don't wanna lose the opportunity uh, of not informing Islam to this uh, person that you're interacting with. I would always turn any discussion into a discussion of teaching them about Tawheed, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and about the hereafter. Then I would come back to the question because as you have this discussion, you, you will probably you're going to calm that person down a little bit. And then you come back and address the question. And you can, based on the time of the person, you can either do it in a, I mean, all these things can be said, all these verses. If someone were to say, does the Quran say this? Yes, it says this in the context of the war. That can be a very simple uh, 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 response. But if someone who is more knowledgeable, if they ask about specific verses, then you can get into the details of what that is. But never just jump into the question directly. Always, always go back to uh, Tawheed and Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and the Prophet and the Risala and uh, uh, and the Akhirah. Then come back to the questions, and that would be my advice. I'm sure that there is a one a session coming up as to how to convey Islam uh, in uh, five minutes. I guess I think uh, there are many different techniques. I have my own technique. I follow a technique called Tawheed, and uh, of course, my dear brother Dr. Sabil, he follows a method called OMG High. And my brother, uh, Sheikh Abdurrahim Green, he follows uh, the GORAP method. Uh, so, I mean, people have their own uh, techniques uh, uh, in terms of how to present Islam in five minutes. Like I said, I have mine, and inshallah, I think uh, we're gonna, uh, I think there is a topic that's gonna come uh, in the next few weeks or so. Okay, thank you. And also, like, just from a logical perspective, if, if uh, as some of these questions are, if, if Islam is so violent and, and it's all about, uh, you know, finding people and killing them why 
logically in the world, when you have two billion Muslims, the yep. more people are not dying, you know, yeah. especially in the West and, and, and Europe and things of that nature, you know. Yeah. If, yeah, well, yeah, that's very true. Okay, and, and, and the next uh, question is, um, so for the reason of the conquest, was the spread of the message, and especially, okay, and then this is another question. Um, and, and you're saying that the Islam was spread by this, I mean, the claim is that Islam was spread by the sword. Uh, and we find today that Islam is the most oppressed uh, way of life, and Islam is the fastest growing religion. How, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, so that it's about the intellectual jihad, right? Islam is always about the intellectual uh, intellectual jihad, and many uh, reverts that I uh, speak to, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, uh, opened their hearts, and uh, and I mean, no one forced them, no one forced them to uh, uh, with a sword or with a gun to accept Islam, but they find uh, Islam more compatible with the nature with the with the human thought process and we say as with the fitra right i mean when someone who is looking is searching for the truth and uh, if you explain islam then the fitra will kick in and it will make them uh, accept uh, uh, islam so it's never i mean you can come up with so many examples uh, to uh, where islam was spread not through the, through the sword right if we talk about malaysia if we talk about indonesia if we talk about many other places islam did not reach there through uh, a, a war Yes, Islam reached other places through battles and war. We should not, uh, I mean, we should not deny that. But Islam also reached to other places without war through the merchants, through trade and, 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 and whatnot. And even today, what war is happening? And like you pointed out, Islam is one of the fastest uh, growing religions of, uh, uh, in the world, uh, in the USA and other places. But I also want to correct that again. Uh, Islam is not the fastest growing religion anymore. Uh, uh, atheism is pretty much faster than that, uh, and uh, yeah, yeah. then we also have this uh, issue of uh, people going back and whatnot. Yeah, well, that's probably a talk, a talk for another day. Yeah, that's true. Um, but atheism doesn't claim to be a religion, so <laughs> we need to say the some do. Some, some people, some people yeah, do. Yeah, that is that is true. Zakhlaq. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think we have one more one more question. Uh, so the reason for these conquests was to spread the message was that the uh, to spread the message of islam the, the sorry could you repeat the question so the reason for the conquest what was the reason for the conquest it, it's it's it's, it's multi-prong right i mean uh, if you look at the conquest towards the persians and uh, through uh, the romans i mean there were some legitimate fear uh, for the Muslims, because Romans previously attacked in the Battle of Malta, and we also, I mean, they, I mean, uh, they were, I mean, we also, Prophet also went during the Battle of Tabuk uh, to uh, fight the Romans. So there was some legitimate fear too, and uh, and, and and of course, uh, Persians are living very close to the Roman territory, they can learn uh, from them uh, and cause similar harm. So it is, it's a kind of defensive, but at the same time, it is also to spread the message of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, uh, to uh, to other parts of the world. But again, never through never putting and uh, never forcefully converting them we have to keep that in mind because we want to liberate a place to be able to successfully convey the message so if you're able to convey the message that, that's that's the whole idea is to be able to uh, oppress remove this oppression this moral oppression of worshiping someone else besides allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them an opportunity to hear about islam to hear about allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of course, if they wish, they can convert. Otherwise, they can just pay the jizya. I know living in the 21st century, if we compare the 21st century, uh, our current norms and practices with what happened in the, uh, uh, in, in the 6th century, it's not going to match. The world worked differently during those times. How did the Roman territories uh, spread? How did the Persian territories spread? It's all through battle and war. That is the way of the world at the time. And of course, the people who followed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they also followed that, but they never forcefully converted people like other religions did. Because other religions, I mean, we know from history, if they were not, if they did not convert, they were even burnt at stake, right? So we, we all, we know this from, uh, from history, but Islam never did that. Islam never converted people forcefully, but wanted to give people an opportunity to hear the message of Islam. Zakalakh, thank you very much. Inshallah, uh, I'll leave the last uh, closing remarks for you. But I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, so our website is whyislam.org. 
there's a lot of material that you can go there and inshallah if you wanted to give uh to your non-Muslim friends and uh, family members that are interested in learning about Islam and you yourself you can enhance your intellectual discourse by reading about it Jesus in Islam uh, Islam explain uh, Moses in Islam and uh, concept of God in Islam women in Islam uh, we have all these information free on why islam.org uh, these recordings are, are online at dawa.ikna.org and also, uh, last thing is, there is a nice uh, documentary from P PBS. It's called uh, Empire of Faith, uh, Islam Empire of Faith. Uh, it's a very beautiful documentary that was done by PBS, inshallah, if you wanted to uh, learn a little bit more about the conquest as well, inshallah. So with that, I'll leave you to close it off, and inshallah, we'll end the webinar. Inshallah. I mean, uh, all I want to say is uh, that uh, we all have a responsibility of uh, conveying this message to others. And I know that I'm speaking to a, a, a Muslim audience, and that's why I'm able to uh, speak free and uh, give you uh, some insights as well. Uh, and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the, in, in the Quran, uh, sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal hasana, that you have to invite others to the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with hikmah, with fair preaching. So use wisdom in how you present the information to others. You don't have to go and talk about uh, Islam spreading through sword and things like that at your first conversation. They can come later. And if you are asked the question, you don't have to hide. I mean, this is how the world, like, like I explained, the empire spread. The empire was expanded through the initial, initial uh, in the Islamic history, the, emp uh, the empire was spread through, uh, uh, through, uh, through, uh, through the conquest, but Islam was also always through giving them the message and the choices was always upon the people who heard the message so it's our job to invite the people and rest is you leave it uh, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I also want to mention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah al-anqabut wa la tujadilu ahl al-kitabi illa ibillati hi ahsan that do not argue with the people of the book except with the best way except in the best way so when you're discussing with someone go about it in a, in a, in a nice manner uh, have calm, uh, maintain, even though they might come with some crazy questions, some violent questions, you always maintain your calm because you are the representative of Islam at that booth, at that open house. So you want to make sure that you maintain your composure and you present the Islam in the best way possible. Never lie, by the way, it'll come back to bite you. Never lie. If you don't know something, you simply say that I don't know and you move on. And always learn to segregate or separate the teachings of Islam from the actions of people. Uh, inshallah, again, I, I uh, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, count our time uh, to, uh, in our scale of good deeds and uh, enable us to spread the message of Islam in this part of the world. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khairan wa assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.